because when you start your own practice, you need to stand for your ideas, you know, and it's extremely important. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Today I had the great pleasure of speaking with Ali Reza Razavi, a registered architect in France, uh, in the US and in the UK. So I think that was a, a first to meet an architect with a, a, a treble, if you like, of registrations. Um, and I had the great opportunity to actually visit Ali Reza in his studio whilst I was visiting Paris recently. So a little bit about Ali Reza. Ali holds a master's degree from Columbia University in New York and a master's degree from the Ecole Nationale des Arts Décoratives in Paris. Um, some of his early work collaborations included Eisenman Architects, Aigre and Gandel Sunas, uh, Shigeroban Architects, Francois de Menel Architects, and he was a senior project manager at FTL Hapold in New York. So very interesting. Um, Ali Reza's firm, Studio Razavi Architecture, is one firm of three offices. So they've got studios in Paris, New York, and London. Their portfolio, just go online and have a look at some of their work. It's absolutely stunning um, and spans from Europe to the Americas and includes residential, corporate, hospitality, civic, transportation, and mixed use projects. Selected as an AD100 best designer for four consecutive years, uh, their reputation is built on their ability to translate a client's needs, aspirations, and budget constraints into memorable designs. So in this conversation, uh, Ali Reza and myself, we discussed some of the business lessons uh, that he acquired from working at some of these very interesting studios such as Eisenman uh, and Shiguro Ban. Uh, we talked about the genesis of his practice, how he started, why he started. We talked about some of the challenges that face a design-led architectural practice um, today and things that he may have done differently in the uh, in the past or if he was to start again um and we also looked at some of the practical elements of how do you keep a high design project profitable how do you keep the office operating in a successful manner so sit back relax and enjoy ali reza razabi this episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Ali, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well. Absolute pleasure to be here in Same. your Paris studios. Um, you've got offices here, you've got satellite offices in London, in New York, working on contract administration on a number of projects that you've got there. You've been running your practice here for how long? Best part of 25 years? It's been 15 years. 15 years, okay. Fantastic. This month. And and you've got a, a team of, um, you were saying, the sort of 16, 18 people? Yeah, 16 to 18 people overall. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And you've got a, a, quite an extraordinary portfolio of work in private residential, commercial work, um, both here in Paris and, and abroad. And also, very interestingly, you're one of the, I think, probably the only architect I've met who is registered in France, in the UK, and the US, which is no easy feat by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. So welcome to the show. Absolute Thank pleasure. You. Thanks to, for having me. To, to, to be speaking with you. And I guess the, the first question is, um, you know, how and why did you set up your practice? Um, I set up my practice after working for other architects for about 10 years. And after I had graduated from my master's degree and I think I went for um, my own practice because at one point I felt that I had uh, enough experience, I mean, without some sounding presumptuous, but enough experience to just get started and, and also the desire to, um, 
I guess, express uh, my own ideas uh, through my own projects. So, um, and I had also by that point traveled enough and seen enough practices uh, around the world to better understand how I wanted my own practice to yeah. be structured. Yeah. And interesting, you, you work with some extraordinary figures, you know, quite iconic figures in architecture. Eisenman, we were just chatting about before yes. we hit record, Shiguro Ban, um, I don't know, you were at um, um, Francois de Menil yeah. and Agres and uh, Gandil Sonas. So, so quite an impressive array of, of practices. Um, what were some of the lessons that you learned working with Oh, both, there were these amazing guys? lessons, you know, and, and frankly, I think that I would not have been able to. Uh, build my own firm without having worked with them before because as a uh, as an employee i did witness what they were going through you know um there were ups there were downs and um uh, and it's actually more important to witness downs and see how others handle it mm -hmm. uh than just being you know at a high altitude um cruising uh, yeah. speed. So um, so I learned different things in all these places. I mean, working at Peter Eisenman's office, highly theoretical architect, uh, tenured professor, I think back then he was teaching at Princeton. Uh, same with uh, Mario Gandalsonas and Diana Agrest, both taught, Diana taught at uh, Cooper Union, Mario at Princeton. And so it was a way for me to transition from school to work because they were they had a foot, a strong foot in either uh, field. And for them, it, they were two inseparable entities, you know, mm. so their uh, their research had to be reflected into their design. Right. So that always stuck with me. Then. Working with um, Shigeru, like we were saying earlier, it was a tiny office back then. It was this is 1995, I think, and it was five of us, including Shigeru. And there, I learned an entirely different culture, which was the Japanese culture, of course, and uh, and their working methods and their approach to design and Shigeru's um, process, which was you know um, phenomenal. And of course, he. He strongly encouraged me to travel throughout Japan and, mm. and learn outside of his office, which which I did. Were, were you, was it in English? Were you, were you this was in English because Shigeru had studied at Cooper Union, so right. he spoke English. Okay. Yes. Uh, but I was the only foreigner in the office. Did you learn then. Japanese? What's your I, I learned a few words, but unfortunately I didn't practice and then I lost it all. Yeah. Um, and um, and then later on, working with Francois in New York was extremely interesting because he's really the one who taught me the importance of craftsmanship in mm. a way, you know, and and the uh, the link between design and the built objects from furniture to buildings. You know, he was extremely uh, focused on quality, on detailing and um, so I learned a lot with him. And then I worked with an, you know, the, the, the joint venture of a British firm, Bureau Happold and FTL, right. Future Tense Limited, which was more engineering design. Mm -hmm. And this was also an, a fantastic uh, apprenticeship for me because it was mostly engineers. Uh, and their culture, I think, should be inseparable with that of the architect. Yeah. So it's very interesting that these, these are kind of iconic figures and practices that you've, you've worked with. What were some of the business lessons that you learned? And, you know, again, someone like Eisenman is a really curious figure for, my, for myself because it's like, well, yes. how does that exist as a, as a kind of commercial right. practice? Right. It's, right. It probably doesn't exist anymore. Okay? <laughs> um, you know, I think Peter's practice probably could stay afloat because he was a tenured professor, mm -hmm. uh, I believe. Uh, was he tenured at that time? I'm not sure, but he taught, you know, he taught everywhere. He was an invited uh, lecturer all over the world. He wrote books, uh, published a lot, was sought after. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was most certainly a stream of revenue uh, for Peter, which allowed him in those days to make a living. The office was certainly not 
generating any income for him. You yeah. Know? Or maybe it did at times, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure it did not overall. Well, was it the kind of place where he was very selective? About, you know, he wasn't just doing any old kind of, you know, rear extensions Absolutely. to keep the lights on. Absolutely. It was only of a certain caliber. Absolutely. Well, I mean, as you know, Peter built a few houses earlier on in his career uh, with the Tehrani influence. And, but then he moved on to larger jobs, more mm -hmm. institutional projects. He built a few. But then he was mostly essentially not having the opportunity to bring his projects to fruition. And this was extremely challenging, I think, to mm. have an office. And back then, it was a fairly large office in New York. It was in Chelsea, on, I think it was on 23rd Street or 22nd. Uh, but it was a different New York, too. You know, you could live with less. Mm. Uh, today, that model would be, I think, impossible to um, emulate unless you're independently wealthy. But um, I don't think it was Peter's case. Mm. And what, so what brought you out to Japan then? How did you? I, I won a scholarship for a, um, from an engineering school in Paris. Right. And I went to Japan and I was introduced to Shigeru through common friends of ours. I mean, actually, Diana Agrest. And, um, and, and so I started an internship at his office, which was, uh, which was phenomenal, as I said before. But the, over, the real breakthrough for me was obviously discovering Japan mm. and, and the culture and the way they worked. And, uh, and it all looks very familiar, but it's all so <laughs> different, you know. And this, again, is, this is, I think, in 1995, nothing was written in English. There was no internet. There, was no, there were no mobile phones. And so it was a phenomenal trip. Um, phenomenal trip. And I learned a lot on how more specifically, a, a, you know, a cultures are produce a certain type of built environment. You know, Japan was traditionally a poor country, a small country, an island mm -hmm. uh, facing this giant uh, country across the ocean, uh, China, from which it in, had inherited part of its culture. And um, so it had to exist in front of this, uh, you know, formidable country. And it developed its own culture with very modest means, uh, but with such great poetry. Amazing. And so when you when, when did you kind of set up here then? What, what was that? What was the, you know? Well, after I graduated from school in New York, I, I worked in New York for about 10 years mm -hmm. after that. And, um, and then when I felt I had reached a point where I no longer wanted to f work for another firm in New York, I can, you know, I had a couple of uh, opportunities to work on smaller projects and I figured I would just um, take the leap and I did. Uh, these projects were based in France. So initially I started working remotely on them, mm -hmm. but it soon turned out to be too challenging. So I moved to France and where I had studied. So I spoke the language yeah. and set up shop here. And then a couple of years later, because I had lived so long in New York, had clients in New York asking me for projects in New York. So I, you know, I set up shop in New York again and then then clients in London. So I set up shop in London. And this is how the, the um, you know, the three different professional licenses happen. Amazing. Yeah. And where yeah. are you from originally? I'm from Iran. You're from Iran. Yes, I was born in Iran, but I moved to uh, I moved to France when I was about nine. Got it. OK, so so it's really, really interesting kind of cultural heritage yes. and kind of, you know, there seems to be quite an ease that you've had in your career of being able to adapt and move and relocate and you know Definitely. immerse yourself into another yes. culture. I mean, going to Japan to, to yes. work for any period of time is that's, you know, for most people, that's kind of a bit mind bending. Yeah, no, I mean, it's true. Yeah, I think leaving my country at a younger age um, probably forced me to, um, because obviously we left, you know, overnight. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I think it forced me to adapt mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and take advantage of the different cultural uh, landscapes in which, to which I was confronted. Do you have a, a preference to which country you prefer to practice in? To practice? You know, I think there's, in, we've been having projects in Italy for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Milan for a year as a student. And, um, 
But I think all these countries contribute to my knowledge and culture in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I, uh, there's not a, I don't have a preference per se. I have to say that there's a, there's a degree of freedom in, in the U.S. that is very interesting. It doesn't necessarily lead to good architecture, strangely enough, mm -hmm. but that freedom exists. Um, obviously, because the U.S. is so large, not everything is the same, right? Sure, building sure. in New York is not the same as building in Nevada. But, yeah. um, but I find that to be always interesting, that level of freedom, which is also, you know, in itself can be a problem. But, um, but no, I enjoy, I enjoy all these countries. I was recently in Somaliland for, a, uh, to look at a project and, and it looked fascinating because mm -hmm. it was sort of a bottom up or top down kind of a project in the sense that you couldn't just sit down in any, you know, in Paris and start designing a project there. You had to go and visit and see what were the means and methods available for a project mm -hmm. and then start designing. So no, I, I enjoy all these places, you know, they bring their idiosyncrasies to uh, the way we think of a project and design it ultimately. It, have you found there being uh, like there's a way that you need to adapt yourself in terms of different types of international clients? So, so for example, in the US, um, I mean, I've often got the, the sense in the, U, in the US there is a much more like this idea of freedom. Like that, the, the, that someone said to me once that the US is an idea. And it's the idea of freedom. Yes. And yes. inbuilt with that idea of freedom is this kind of, you know, a capitalist structure and an a very entrepreneurial culture. And people are very proud business people. And, yes. and sales yes. culture is ingrained in the whole culture. Whereas here in, in France, it's very, very, it's very different. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Listen, I mean, that, that, that's a really interesting question because it, it takes us to... Um, probably the core of this conversation is that different types of office structures, I think, lead to different types of designs, you know, and I'm teaching a class currently here in Paris at, a, at an engineering school on this specific topic, right. you know, the difference between practicing in France, Europe generally, and the US. Mm -hmm. And what I try and focus on is what is it that ultimately built you know, what are, what are, what are the, um, the forces that built the, the American culture mm -hmm. and what that, what the consequences in terms of, you know, architectural practice and the way businesses are organized are. And, um, and yes, because the U S is business oriented, you know, it doesn't have all the, um, sort of s social, um, apparatus, you know, structure and, envelope you know a uh, parachutes that exist in Europe yeah the safety you're pretty, nets, the safety nets you're pretty much on your own right mm -hmm. so uh, so you need to make sure that any business is viable yeah and and that obviously impacts your uh, the way you think of your designs and your relationship to clients and the type of jobs you uh, seek and it's different in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's definitely different in Europe. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating conversation, I think. But I mean, the notion of a corporate firm was born in the US, I yeah. think, you know, I mean, we can probably investigate that. But I think, you know, the large offices that were born in the 30s and, and then started climbing in the 40s and 50s and 60s, you know, the SOMs, the KPFs, the HOKs, etc. That's a, first and foremost, a business model that was I think quite foreign that's to, very, to Europeans. Yeah, that's you know? very interesting. That's very interesting when you consider the kind of heritage of European Absolutely. practices being much Absolutely. more this kind of smaller scale yes. atelier boutique. Absolutely, studio like you know, close to a certain idea of craftsmanship, mm -hmm. which, which you could still you know I think keep in mind when you run a larger office. I mean, I think some of these offices that I just named have pretty amazing output you know i mean you may like or dislike their design sure but but the output is phenomenal mm -hmm. you know the quality the i'm sure they these businesses are extremely well well run and uh and the projects that they deliver i mean we know we all know uh we've all visited you know projects by som kpf etc and they're flawless you know most of the time 
And that is the reflection of how they're organized, not so much their uh, the sort of design skills that are being pushed in uh, at school. Yes. You know, and uh, and of course at schools, and I've been to a few, I was never told these things. You know, I was never told that if you wanted to practice and have your own office, mm -hmm. you needed to be also a business person. You need yeah. to be mindful of how your business is run, you know? And certainly the American culture understood that earlier on, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but maybe also because it's a larger country and, you know, they had different demands and hence these offices were, this typology of office was born out of that. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And, and, I, and I guess as well, the, the kind of industrialization that was happening in the US and factory building and, and kind of, you know, things like the motor, the, the motor industry and the influence that that had on, you know, certainly yes. modernism on yes. the, the West Coast. Yes, absolutely. We start seeing architecture, the way it's being, yes. you know, constructed is totally different to how it has been for hundreds of years. Absolutely. And, absolutely. and that, that being reflected in the business practices yes. becomes very interesting. Yes. I mean, no, I mean, historically and socially and technologically, it's, it's a fascinating conversation. Mm. Of course it is, you know, because, you know, if you look at New York in the 20s and in the 30s, you know, skyscrapers are starting, you know, they, what essentially allowed for taller buildings is the invention of the elevator. And, uh, but initially they're essentially extruded Roman temples or Greek temples, <laughs> uh, steel structure inside, but an extrusion, right? And, um, and so the switch to something that is more in tune with the culture and the technique happens at a later stage. You know, mm -hmm. I think it probably happens in the mid thirties and late thirties when German architects start moving to the U S and, um, and that's an interesting moment in time, you know, say when Mies van der Rohe moves to the U S that's a very interesting moment in time because he brings this, this, theoretical approach, this intellectual approach to architecture, mm -hmm. um, the, the notion of craftsmanship and collides it with, uh, the American notion of, uh, corporate structures, you know, and, um, and I think they've been very successful at it, you know, but I mean, obviously other countries are emulating this equally successfully. I mean, China's there's amazing projects being built mm -hmm. in China. You know, I mean, last time I was in Shanghai, I couldn't believe it. The quality of the work and not just the buildings, but uh, urban planning, parks, phenomenal, mm -hmm. phenomenal. So uh, so there, there is a correlation between the context, the structure of your office and the output. How, how have you dealt with this kind of tension, if you like, between the need to be a systematized business in many ways and and you know protects your profit and also i mean just look at the caliber of your work retain that kind of craftsmanship around everything you're doing this is a struggle that i see and talk to so many architects about like it's a it's like a, it's a core challenge how, how yes. have you kind of navigated yes. it yes listen i think that so i've been practicing i mean the office has been around for 15 years and um I think I've clearly chosen the, the more studio version of architectural practice. And um, I mean, I guess there are many explanations to that, but I think it's important for me to be able to be involved in every single project. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, the scale of the projects that we deal with is also important. I mean, we, we have very small projects and we have large projects and and they're extremely time consuming mm -hmm. if you want to be involved with every single detail and i think that this is something that i have not yet sort of structured myself or the office to pass on to others you know i mean obviously we have project managers mm -hmm. and architects and interns but but I, I need to be involved in, um, in making sure that these different important stages of each project are, are completed as per my idea of quality. Yeah. How, 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 how do you think, and this is interesting, how do you think leadership differs, say, in like a kind of boutique firm, like, um, or like an atelier type firm versus your sort of corporate structure that we were just discussing? 
I think probably, I mean, probably one of the differences is which, which I've, you know, experienced as I went through these smaller offices and maybe larger ones is that the, the smaller offices, the boutique type of, you know, atelier type offices allow you to be closer to uh, the people or the person who generate the initial ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great. Humanly speaking, that's great. In larger offices, you learn more from more people. Mm. So it's a more sort of, you know, if you could sort of put this in geometric terms, it's more sort of a horizontal lear learning because there are so many different people from which you can learn so many different things. Whereas in smaller offices, you tend to look at the founder or, you know, whoever is the most senior person around, which is usually the founder, uh, as your learning source. But it becomes a more maybe personal relationship and it it clearly has a different aura to it, you know, yeah. and uh, and I have to say I enjoyed both. Uh, but maybe to be more specific, as far as your question goes, how do you how do you make the jump from a boutique sized office to a more structured corporate? I really don't know. I mean, is it something that one wants to have or or something that once gradually builds into? I'm not sure. I think that I've never really uh, looked at the size of my office or the size of our jobs as a reflection of the quality of our work. Mm. So designing a chair is as important as designing a 100,000 square foot building, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. And, and I think they both reflect our ethos, you know, yeah. um, hence me being involved. <laughs> so, so, and, and, and so in, in terms of your role as a practice founder and owner, how has that changed over the years, over the last 15 years from when you first started? When you first started, was it just you by yourself and you were kind of... It was me with uh, one other employee, architect. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I mean, so I used to take care of the coffee machine and the Xerox and, and, and do AutoCAD back then. And all of that is obviously gone now. Um, and uh, so I think what I tend to do more now, I'm more involved in our sort of day-to-day -day operations, but as far as how the projects are sort of overseeing every project in terms of its, uh, which stage it is at, you know, schematic design, design development, et cetera, uh, or construction. And then at the same time, being mindful of our, um, more long-term goals in terms of project typology, what we're interested in, you know, mm -hmm. how we want to build, where we want to build, and what we're trying to say with those projects, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that what we want to say is extremely simple, mm -hmm. but extremely complex to achieve. We want to build beautiful buildings and the definition of a beautiful building, regardless of the design, is the craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. And how do you make these opportunities for yourself to be able to get yourself? Because when you look at a portfolio like what you've, what you've got, you know, it's, it's such beautiful crafted work. But this is not easy for most architects to even get into a conversation with the right person in the, in right. the first place. How right. has that right. kind of evolved? And what have, has, it, has it been a conscious thing? Or is it something that naturally kind of comes to you? You're very social. You, you're hanging out in the right circles. Or Well, I think back to what you were saying before. Um, I was... Because I was forced, I think, to adapt to different cultures... Mm. Um, I was always extremely curious to meeting other people. And, um, and, and the more foreign to my culture they were, the more attracted to them I was. So um, this, uh, I think, allowed for a certain cultural flexibility. Mm -hmm. But in professionally speaking, I think I never shied away from things that I did not know. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I tend to pursue things that I've never done before because as Peter Rice famously said once when he was challenged by the French authorities for uh, Beaubourg, <laughs> you know, I think he wanted to use um, cast steel for uh, the, the gerberettes, you know, and the, the uh, external structure of Beaubourg. Yeah. And, uh, and so these French engineers challenged him and said, you know, how are you going to make this thing work? We've never done this before, blah, blah, blah. And he, his answer was like that, well, because it's never been done before, it's going to be flawless. Mm -hmm. 
And that's exactly what I'm interested in. You know, mm. I'm interested in getting involved in things that I haven't necessarily done before. Uh, because I know that I will fully investigate them and be involved with them. So, I mean, it's a slow process, obviously, you know, and, um, but yeah, I think I've always been, I've never shied away from challenges, geographic challenges mm -hmm. or uh, typology challenges, hence the diversity of our portfolio. Has it, has it been, have you had like conscious strategies for winning work? So you've perhaps gone, I want to get work with this kind of client or this kind of sector. And then you've gone after it and kind of made a landscape map of like who are the key players right. and being strategic like that involved in it. Or? You know, I would love, I've, I've been <laughs> dreaming of doing this <laughs> since I started. But I never had the time. Yeah. Uh, every year I promise myself that I'm going to do exactly that, but I never get the opportunity to sit down and strategize and map out. Um, so no, it's been organic. You know, we've been getting phone calls, we were published and friends and so on and so forth. So it's essentially word of mouth and through publications, but, but not through us actively seeking specific clients. Mm -hmm. Um, which I would love to do, you know, I would, you know, I would love to be able to sit down and make the time to yeah. strategize. Um, well, this, well, this is the other interesting part then is, is, you know, your ability to be marketing or like, how do you get your, how do you get your name out there? Because there's, and it's, you know, that's, it's interesting because there's a lot of architects, extraordinarily talented, do beautiful work, and then no yes. one sees it. Yes, absolutely. And then that becomes a problem. Absolutely. So, so if you're not str being strategic and, right. In networking and building relationships, then you've at the very least got to get your work out there. Yes. How, how have you yes. done well, that? Well, listen, things have changed radically, right? Um, the internet. Uh, so it used to be that you needed to essentially wait for someone to see your work, mm -hmm. to be interested in your work. These days, obviously, with social media and, uh, and your own website, things have radically changed. Uh, I think I understood earlier on maybe not early enough, that your projects needed to be impeccably documented, you know. Um, so that's not, that's something that should not be, uh, you shouldn't cut corners uh, when it comes to documenting your projects. And, um, and then it just happened organically and gradually, you know, I think that it's like a forest fire, you know, when you, when there's, you publish one job, then things start to mechanically happen one after the other. I think what I was very conscious of is that even the smallest job that I got when we started, I wanted to make sure that there was something interesting to be shown or said or photographed, right. you know, even a tiny detail. Mm. Um, and I wasn't really thinking of documenting it back then. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad I didn't for some of them, but I knew that sort of instinctively that the craftsmanship that will be put into the detailing of even the tiniest job would would pay me back at some level you know and um and so gradually it did how, how do you know when it's not the right fit for a client you never know right you never know unfortunately you never know unfortunately for us and unfortunately for the clients you i was know? hoping you were going to give me a, a whole series of red flags that you've developed over the yeah last. i wish i wish i could you know, but I, you know, I've been in this business for 20 years plus, mm -hmm. but, but no, I've not been, a, and I don't, I don't think anyone can say, you know, no matter how much due diligence and it works both ways, right? I mean, some of our clients do tremendous due diligence on us. And uh, obviously as an architect, when you're, you know, you're limited, it's not that much due diligence you can do on a private client. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's just luck, I guess, you know, and at times it doesn't work mm. uh, at times. It just seems like you cannot satisfy the client, no mm -hmm. matter how hard you work, no matter how many options you design. There are times where you fail. Mm. So you kind of, and it's very frustrating. And, and what do you do in those situations? You just kind of go into a damage limitation. Yeah. Series process. Of absolutely. Absolutely. It's very painful. I think in architecture, I'm not sure how it is in other businesses, mm -hmm. but when you lose a client in the process of, you know, we've lost projects in the middle at the beginning, at mm -hmm. the end for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's, it's tough, not so much 
I mean, it's tough business-wise, of course, just like any other, any other business, but it's also tough emotionally because in architecture, you just put so much of yourself in your design, you know? So seeing a design gone, you know, or is always extremely challenging, very tough. I, you know? I, I think that's some, something that's quite interesting for a lot of young architects as well, is to recognize, yes. you know, uh, like yes. how much of your work yes. never actually sees the light of yes, day. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, mm. absolutely. I mean, um, when I was at Peter's, we were working on construction documents for, um, for a center for the arts. And I mean, this set of drawings was supposed to go out to bid the following month or so, you know, and we were designing literally nuts and bolts and the project was stopped, you know, and the office had been working on it for God knows how many months, you know, mm -hmm. charrette after charrette, night and day, literally. And, uh, and then it was halted, you know, and, uh, it must have been an immense frustration for Peter. You know, he never showed it. You know, I, I, I wasn't close enough to him to, yeah. to see him being hit by this news. But, but, you know, half the office left, you know, I mean, that must have been extremely tough, extremely mm. tough. And yes, you're absolutely right. You know, a majority probably of projects never see the light of day. It's very fascinating. Regardless of the size of your office, right? Yeah, the yeah. smallest office or the largest office. Well, I remember I, I used to work at Richard Rogers' practice. And I remember on the first day there, we were being toured around the kind of model shops. And one of the partners said, you know, basically 80% of all the work you're ever going to do here doesn't get built. And it was like that kind of like, oh, wow. wow. What a painful realization. Wow. What is, wow. why, why, why does that happen in wow. architecture? That's a harsh introduction. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was kind of like, oh right, so all these ideas, and that was, and that, you know, I remember as, as a young architect that being a struggle, certainly trying to get licensed as well. Yes. Where you need to be able to have your experience run all the way through. How how have you dealt with that? Certainly, you know, in terms of like nurturing talent and um, helping and supporting people get get licensed and develop their career when you know you are dealing with this kind of a volatile industry, if you like, an industry that's always on this. Knife edge. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really challenging. It's really tough. Emotionally, it's extremely tough. Mm. And, um, and I think anyone, any architect that says it isn't is probably lying because you put so much of yourself in any design, regardless of scale, yeah. that um, it's really loaded with emotions. Um, so I think what I try and do again, even even today, after 15 years of uh, our office being in, in business, is I don't turn down any project regardless of scale. And as long as we can make a living, mm -hmm. and that is, of course, a fundamental criteria, you know, at our stage of uh, practice, I want to make sure that there's an there's, there's design opportunities that we create in the project right you know so if we take on a job we that's our main criteria create design opportunities create mm -hmm. create opportunities for uh craftsmanship um and this is i hope uh i believe this is what has created uh you know an aura for our office and this is how i we we attract younger talents yeah. and, and, and train them and, and try and hand over this culture of us that, you know, and, and it's a separate conversation, but in, in the era of BIM mm -hmm. and, and all 3D drawing sets, that's even more challenging than it was before, you know? Yeah. Because uh, 2D drawings at least allowed for some kind of a focus uh, an effort from your part to imagine this 2D drawing in 3D. Mm. But that effort is no longer required of you because yeah. the computer produces that 3D image for you um, to a high level of precision. That's something I've been struggling with a lot, but it's a separate conversation. But, uh, but yeah, I think that what we try and do is make sure that even if there's if it's the smallest piece of furniture in a project, that it has its specific aura mm. so how do you ensure that there's a design opportunity within a project does, it, does this happen at the very outset of the project before yes. you say yes to it and and how do you know that that design opportunity is going to be in alignment for example with the client's brief or their business agenda and again we come back to this kind of 
this conflict of, and it's interesting, this, the, the description you were saying earlier about the, the kind of SOM practices that the whole structure has been, uh, the businesses have been grown around a kind of industrialized form, yes. way of making buildings. Yes. And then looking for design opportunity, opportunities with a client, and they might have a different idea about something. Absolutely. How, Absolutely. Do, you, how do you kind of negotiate Absolutely. that or to make sure that, you know, do, yes. you, do you take the Mies van der Rohe approach of don't talk to the client about architecture, ask them about <laughs> their dog? Or right. Well, I think if you had asked this question 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I would have given you a different answer. Mm. Because when you start your own practice, you need to stand for your ideas, mm -hmm. you know, and it's extremely important. Because those first years are the founding years of your practice, you know, in terms of aura, in terms of identity. Uh, so the early years are years of struggle and you cannot compromise. You need, you need to fight to see your ideas come materialized, you know, and uh, so those first years are, are challenging. They're fun, but they're challenging. Mm -hmm. At this stage, hope, I mean, we're lucky enough that people come to us because to some extent they've seen something that we've designed that they like. So it's less of a challenge and right. they're more open to our ideas, probably because there's they this experience. They, they, know they, they, they know what they're getting into, yeah. right? And um, so I think we're, we're, we're less, uh, it's not that we're, we were, I guess when you start, you have to be forceful at some level, mm -hmm. you know, you need to, you need to spend more time explaining your ideas and, and pushing them through with, you know, specific criteria and explaining. So investing time, essentially. Today, we seem to be faster in explaining ourselves and why we're doing the things we're doing. We've, of course, learned from our, mis our mistakes and our mistakes, you know, we've made more mistakes than um, successful decisions, obviously. And that's, that's the right uh, way to do it. This you is know? a hard one business experience. Because yeah, you don't learn otherwise. Yeah. You, know? you don't learn from your successes. You know, you learn when you fail, you know. And um, so back to your question today, I think that that first and that initial part of sort of design compa being design compatible with the client is less of an of an issue. Yeah. And then we, I think the clients are now expecting those surprises from us, mm -hmm. you know? And so we tend to analyze the projects thoroughly before we start design to make sure that we identify opportunities, mm -hmm. you know? How, how is money discussed in the office? How do you deal with the, with the conversation around money? How does it, you know, when you're looking at a, a fee, when you're putting together your fee proposals yes. and the general culture around money and how it kind of, its compatibility with design opportunities. How, how do you approach right. that? Well, of course, that's, uh, you know, that's another central question. What I learned when I was working, and again, I'm, I'm thankful I had these experiences before because when you start your own business, it's always easier if you have had previous uh, role models or examples or, and um, so what I, and, and all these different experiences, the one that I was most interested in was uh, when project managers, and I was a project manager at one point, were involved in the contracts and the fees. Uh, they had access to the contract. Right. I know many offices where project managers don't have access to the contract. They don't have access to the fee structure and et cetera. To me, it was key because it allowed me when I was a project manager to understand notions of time Absolutely. versus design. Yeah. And it's not just an open bar, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so, so this, is, this is what I do. The project managers here at the office are obviously involved, not just in um, the information that's, you know, they have access to the uh, information, the contract, but they also help write the contracts. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, yes, it's a business, and um, and this was never taught at school. Yeah, you know, it was almost like a dirty word. You know, architecture and business don't mingle, and um, but if it's not a business, there cannot be architecture, yeah. and that's as simple as that, right? So, um, so the way we structure our our contracts is essentially teamwork. Mm -hmm. You know, because 
every contract profits from the previous experience, you know, mm -hmm. where we failed or where it worked well. And, you know, and of course, because architecture and construction is always confronted to unforeseen conditions, uh, inflation, site conditions, so on and so forth, you learn from all these experiences and, and you sort of feed your new contracts with all these, um, with, all, with all this information. So it's important that more people be involved mm -hmm. in, in drafting these contracts than just a single person. Well, that, that's really interesting because, you know, I think the, the kind of old guard of architectural practice would often keep, <coughs> would often keep that kind of information um, secret. Absolutely. Um, and as, Absolutely. As, as you're saying, if your project managers don't know what the fees are, how on earth can they translate it to time to yes. allocate to yes. team members? Yes. Otherwise, yes. And then we get into this very vulnerable yes. position of somebody spent three weeks designing something incredibly beautiful, but was completely irrelevant and not, not part of the project. Absolutely. And that's half absolutely. the fee gone. No, you, no, absolutely. You've still got to pay their, right. their no, payroll absolutely. every month. I mean, yes, I think that there is um, there's, there's definitely a moment of transition between school and, you know, your first professional experiences because, you know, uh, you charrette all the time, it's your project, it's your baby, you, you, you know, you invest so much time in it. We tend to move away from the charrette culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, we tend to, we don't work on weekends. We, uh, and, and I think that this is also something that I learned in the different offices that I worked because at, at times I would work seven day weeks, night and day. And, you know, I, no one forced me to do it. You know, we would do it because we were passionate about the work and we wanted to see it happen. But uh, ultimately, I think that it's also a reflection of how you're organized. You know, mm. I think that you don't need to go through this for quality work to happen. You know, it's just a matter of how you're organized. And um, so it's all part of creating an office culture. You know, I think, yeah. and uh, and and it impacts your turnover for mm. sure because people outside know that you're working, you know, uh, twenty four seven or not. You know how you organize the quality of your work, and again, I think that the type of work that you put out there is to some level the reflection of how your office is organized. Mm. It can, of course, never be perfect, you know, but. Um, but it at least shows it to some degree. It's the reflection of how things are organized, mm -hmm. for sure. Yes. How how do you kind of curate time within the office? Because this is this is an interesting one about you know many are we we often hear the dictum of don't sell time, manage time, and actually the art of managing time inside of an architecture practice is it sounds easy in theory, in principle. We can use wonderful things like the rule of thirds and. A third of it goes to the salary, a third yes. of it goes on overhead, yes. a third of it goes on profit. But actually, the tools and the mechanisms, and more importantly, the disciplines to actually have that happen in a business, it's quite complicated. It's quite, it's quite an art. How do you guys manage time? What, what kind of tools and infrastructure have you developed and put in place? Well, <clears throat> we use timesheets, obviously. Yeah. Um, we... We try and be very rigorous on the initial timeline that we've allocated for each phase. Right. Um, that's really uh, a fundamental rule. So I think that every because everybody in the team knows what the deadlines and the timelines are, mm -hmm. it's sort of organically happens mm -hmm. you know we don't um i mean we have weekly team meetings where in which we allocate time right. for each person in each project of course it's no science because you know at times you need feedback from construction site you don't get it at, on time and it's a domino effect but but it kind of works mm -hmm. the idea that listen 30% of your time needs to be spent on um, schematic design for this project. Be mindful of that. It tends, it tends to work, you know. Um, so I think that this is how we've sort of managed our times. Uh, not being too strict about it. I mean, being involved with the timesheet, but 
but not being too strict about it. You know, there needs to be flexibility, obviously. And of course, at times you get lucky, what you were supposed to do get, you know, happens in, uh, uh, faster than you, you had planned. But, um, but I think we're not, we tend to plan it earlier on mm -hmm. in the week, but leave some flex. Right. So there's always like a 10% floating here and there to allow, to absorb, uh, you know, over extension on this or that or mm -hmm. uh, shorter uh, timeline. But, um, but yeah, managing time is, um, is key. As far as I'm concerned, I think that <clears throat> I rely m more and more on um, digital tools. Right. Because I travel a lot. You know, I'm in meetings often and, uh, and having the ability to sketch on my phone or a tablet at a, at a high quality and, and email that sketch has changed uh, my life. Yeah, and certainly things are extraordinary nowadays. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, you can come up with really fantastic uh, drawings um, with digital tools now. Uh, I still use, you know, paper and, uh, and pencils, but, um, but that has helped me a lot in my downtime when traveling or being in, you know, waiting for a meeting, et cetera, and so mm. on and so forth. So, um, so I don't think we're, I don't, I'm not sure I can, you know, answer super specifically to the question, but we're, you know, we have this sort of base rule that everyone should know how much time they should allocate to each project yeah. and each phase per week, mm -hmm. but keeping it flexible. Yeah. And then there's a conversation that you have around that and people yes. check in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, just going back to some of the, the practices mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier that you've worked for, Eisenman, Shiguru, Ban, these are practices that perhaps now are starting to, you know, they're, they're in that of a, a kind of generation of practices where there's lots of succession planning happening and people are taking over. Um, True. We see it in lot, lots of the star mm -hmm. architects of the past where they've got a new generation. Yes. yes. Has this been something that you've started to think about in terms of like how you're cultivating yeah, le leadership? Yeah, absolutely. Or? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I tend to not be, um, we'll see how things go, but I'm not interested in the Titanic, uh, you know, model of the, the ship <laughs> sinking with, <laughs> with the captain. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, what, and, and again, corporate firms have started, you know, Mr. Skidmore has been long gone. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, um, but their office still produces amazing work. So, so it's possible, right? Um, and, and yes, just like you said, you know, some of the more recent star architect firms have started to go down that path and uh, successfully, I think, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, again, I think that it's difficult. There's some things in life that are difficult to plan. You know, you can have objectives, but it also... It highly depends on who you meet and, you know, the, the vibes that you can create. But I'm definitely interested in seeing another generation of, you know, leaders and owners uh, yeah. take. Fantastic. Uh, on. And if you were to, my final question here, sure. um, if you were to meet yourself your fifth, like 15 years <coughs> ago and to sit down and have a cup of coffee, what would be the kind of key bits of business advice you would tell your your former self when, when uh, embarking on this journey? You know, um, I thought about this recently and it's difficult to say mm. because so you meet this person 15 years ago and you tell the person, oh, you know what? You have to be extremely mindful of how you write up your contracts, uh, keep your timesheets. And let, let's assume that this person listens to you and invests time and resources in doing that as opposed, I mean, there's only 24 hours in a day, right? So as opposed to, you know, investing that time in working over hours on the design, different model schemes, etc. And what would the consequences be? I don't know, really. Yeah. You know, so it's, a, it's, a, well, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it is because it's this, it's this balance of like, you know, if I'm advising or speaking with the business, we don't want to turn it into a complete dried out science. Yes. We yes. don't want to do that. Yes. We no, don't we want don't to want do that. Yeah. And yes, we've got to be mindful and be on, on top of our money and, our, and time and all this kind of stuff. But there's still 
the culture of design. And, yes. And again, it, yes. it depends on the practice as well, because there are some practices don't care about design as much. That's fine. That's a, yes. different, a different business model. Yes, yes, absolutely. But the ones right. that are kind of design centric, then right. there's a certain magic and an organicness around that that does yeah. need to be yeah. kind of preserved. Yeah. I think, you know, there's so many different ways to practice architecture. You know, I have friends who, my generation, who practice alone mm -hmm. and they're perfectly happy. Yeah. And others who are partners at these larger firms mm -hmm. and are also happy. So I think, obviously, there's a personal, private side to all these decisions. Um, but it is true that architecture, I think for most of us, was initially a passion driven endeavor, right? Yeah. And, and I think that person 15 years ago would have not necessarily listened <laughs> to me, you know? And I often think about, you know, I'm upset at the schools that I went to, you know, how come they never taught us about managing a company that's, you know, so on and so forth, you know, we should have had uh, business administration classes. But then I'm, I think about it and I'm like, would we have listened? Mm -hmm. Would we have attended those classes? Would, he, would, would we have even chosen those classes, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Well, I'm that's so that, sure. again, that's very interesting as well, the kind of context with which business gets placed at in university. And I certainly remember at university, you know, it was very, you know, we were design focused and anything that had to do with professional practice, you were like, oh. Exactly. I Absolutely. Want, I don't want to go to I that. I don't want to go to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because maybe, I mean, again, it's just such a personal uh, approach. But, but yeah, I think that if I were to be honest, maybe I would have not attended those business administration classes had they been offered to me in school. And, yeah. uh, and maybe they weren't offered out of experience, uh, right, from academia because no one would attend. I don't know. Yeah, possibly, um, very, very possibly. Possibly not. Because, um, so, so it's really interesting. But I, it is... It is one thing that I've noticed is how I was clueless about it when I started mm -hmm. and how 20 years later, the, gen the, you know, this, the new generation is equally clueless about it, you know? <laughs> so it's essentially a passion driven profession or, you know, and, uh, and you need to learn, you need to learn to swim as you dive in the pool. Fantastic. Know? Brilliant. What's the rest of 2023 got in store for you? 2023, uh, lots of exciting things. Hopefully a project in Venice, projects in upstate New York, in London, uh, great projects in Paris, um, maybe Africa. Yeah, Amazing. lots of different exciting things to look forward to. Excellent, brilliant. Well, thank you so much thank for you. your time thank and you, expertise Aaron. today. I enjoyed it. Thank you, so did I. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.